Hallelujah. Um, praise the Lord. I really want to welcome you here. I know that over the weekend that um, I'm going to push your buttons in every area. If you've never heard me speak before, um, there will be things that you uh, believe that have been true to you, and I will enable to do what I can to change some of those things so that you can grow from glory to glory and never get stuck where you've always been. As far as I'm concerned, the church is doing what it's always done and it's always getting what it's always got, and I, we need that to change. We need to be able to do the things that God has destined for us to do and carry in this hour. And if we don't do that, then the church is falling behind. And I don't know about you, but we are way behind the eight ball in what, what we need to do today. And so um, I know that over the weekend you will learn some things that will hopefully be helpful for you. Um, because the, the, my kind of team have already been introduced. Josh is my son, by the way. So if you want to know what I'm really like at home, just go and talk to him. And I don't, I don't think that I kind of change, to be quite honest with you. Um, you know, I'm probably a little bit more weird there at home. I have to tone it down when I come to church. So it's um, one of those exciting things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, d- just for safety reasons, there are some exits in here. So if there is a fire and you need to run, and um, we have, you know, been in situations where there has been fire burning, but it hasn't been physical fire, and it can be seen with a naked eye. So, you know, if, they, if you see fire and you want to run, there are exits. There's one there, there's one there, there's one over there. They will be guarded. And so, <laughs> no, but seriously, there is a gathering point out in the front of the church, I understand, out there where there was a fire you need to gather there so everybody can get out of the, out of the building. The um, toilets and the restrooms are around there now. I, I know that people have heard mentalities, and that, that's okay. We're all sheep. And, um, but, you know, as, as, as somebody who is a farmer and who looks after the sheep, and when they're in the sheep shed, they usually do what the farmer tells them to do or he pens them in. And so um, during the sessions, I'd really ask you, please, if you can um, try and refrain from going to the toilet. I understand that you may need to, and that's wonderful. Um, <laughs> please, please exit building left. And um, when we go, we'll pray for you and just hope you get to the toilet before you really need to go. Um, we do have another issue, and that is something called cell phones. Can everybody hold their cell phone up that has a cell phone here? Hold, hold them up in the air for me. There'd be nice little lights all on top of them. Can you see the lights? If you can't, that's good. If you can, turn them off. I have a donated bucket over there. It's a big blue one. It has some water in the bottom of it. If your cell phone goes off, unless you are a medical person and in an emergency situation or you can't get away from your phone, then I can pray for your addiction to get you free from the binding of that thing. I'm quite happy to do that. It's called Fivefold Repetitive Ministry. And so um, we can, there's a donation bucket there for me. You can't really sell them for very much once they're wet. But um, they make good anchors or good things for fishing rods. And so I really, you know, I'm happy to have them if you want to keep your cell phones on. Um, there will be times when I'm just laying the foundation, <laughs> building it on righteousness and truth. <laughs> there is, um, <laughs> much grace, Father, much grace. <laughs> um, during the times of our worship, and there may be times, and there definitely will be times as we go along, where um, my desire is not that you just hear, but that you engage. And that um, all the Bible, this, this isn't God. This isn't God. This is about God and the way to Him. This is not God. And the only way you will ever find, you'll, you can read about Him, but the only way you'll ever develop a relationship with Him is to be with him. You won't have a relationship by reading about him. Okay? And so during the times of quiet and times that we are here, my desire is that you would enter into what we are doing. And so that through some of the sessions a little bit later on, I, you know, I'm going to give opportunity for engagement in the realm of the kingdom. And, and so there are some, some things that you will talk about in the session a little bit later after we've had more worship time that would be hopefully be helpful for you to do that kind of thing. During those times, um, if you have a prophecy, then please keep it to yourself. Um, I know God can speak any time, and usually when people get around me, they all want to prophesy, and that's a good thing, because it means the fire is starting to be shed over your head. The reason I want that is I don't want to disturb what's going on for what I want to do in the meeting. Um, you know, I know the Holy Ghost does come on you, and you want to do what you want to do. That's great. This isn't about you. This is about me and what I want God to do in the meeting. <laughs> I'm trying to say it nicely. Well, if you want it done badly, well, shut up. <laughs> um, but I just, I just ask you, please, just to be really sensitive. If you have a prophetic word and you want, it, you want it spoken, write it down and give it to me. I will assess it. I will judge it out of the dispensation of Messiah. 
And then um, if I don't want to say it, I won't say it. And so please um, be willingly, willingly, well, sorry, willing to do that. Um, also, I don't mind if you yell and scream and, you know, rah, all those kind of, that's really wonderful. But when it is really quiet, you know, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophets. You can actually bring a hindrance around that stuff so you engage past that stuff. And my desire is that you go beyond. I don't mind that. So, I mean, I love it. I think it's really great because I can see it. I can see the fire going bang, bang. It's all, it's all good. This stuff doesn't worry me one little bit. And it's exciting when I see it start happening because it means people are getting freed up and out of their religious system of having to be really still. But there is a time when you've got to be still before the Lord. And so in those times when you have that, please just honor that kind of pro- protocol. Um, in other words, don't worry about my earring. For some of you folks who don't like my earring. I really like it, and, and I, know, I, know, I know God really likes it. That's because I put it in because he told me to, and um, I had the opportunity to take it out, and I took it out for seven days, and my wife said to me, I really like you to have your earring back because it really suits you, and I really like wearing it. And so now it's gone from being a covenant to just a bit of jewelry. And so if you don't like my earring, well, that's fantastic. You can repent later, and that's all good. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, what I would suggest you do is that over this time, you'll be hearing some things. Make them your own before you try and share them with every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Um, one of the things I've found is that people take my stuff and they go, oh, this is wonderful, and they try and teach it as their own. I've had people overseas take my stuff and teach it at other conferences. That's great. I don't care if they do that. The issue is if they don't live it, all it is is just verbal communication, and giving a person a hope without the access point to go through to that hope. And hope deferred makes a heart sick, but desire, when it grows, becomes a tree of life to them that bear it. And so we need to in, just engage the stuff. And so make it your own. Go through the protocol and processes. Now, there will be times when you will get half. You, I guarantee you, you come here with Christians. You will go home with 5,000 more. It's just like me. When I get a revelation, I go with a question. And then God gives me 5,000 other questions with that one question. So if you think you've got trouble trying to get to grips with what you need to get to grips with, just have pity on me. <laughs> um, but you will find that you will have a lot of questions. And some of those things I won't answer. I won't be able to answer them because I'm not going to have um, the next 150 years trying to cultivate the understanding of some of those things with you. Now, there's some of you in here that are not filled with the Holy Ghost, and that's okay. By the end of the meeting, I'm hoping to lay hands on you and get you filled with the Holy Ghost because you need to be. For you to engage the realm of the kingdom in any measure, you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um, I will be addressing some belief systems that will be inside your life. We've grown up with a lot of things that are true, but they're not all truth. And, they, and we, because we, are, um, we have grown up Greek, we've learned Greek, we've learned the linear learning of the Greek system and structure, what we have seen and what we've been taught isn't necessarily all that there is. And for me, I've experienced a greater depth into the Word of God and a greater measure of revelation. There is a manifold or many-folded wisdom of God that as you engage His kingdom, you begin to see it from a Hebrew perspective. And Hebrews think totally differently than what Greek do. Greek hear and they think. Hebrews see and they feel. And our God is a seeing and feeling God. And from the seeing and feeling then hear and think. Okay, and so we'll cover some stuff a little bit later in the, in the session. Um, we do have some CDs for sale um, at the back there. Um, I would really recommend you get hold of them. Um, I have people who have worn CDs out, and they've worn them out because they listen to them over and over and over and over. I've had one lady that's gone to 11 of my conferences now, and every time I preach, she says, I'm hearing something new. And it does come out differently because you draw whatever's necessary for your life into an atmosphere by your desire. And so I'd really recommend you, you, take, you, you get some of these kind of things. We have this, this one here is um, called um, Inheriting Your Birthright. It has the covenant of the blood in it. It has the covenant of adoption. And what's the other one? And the covenant of promise, which is the promise that was given to Abraham's seed. It also has this thing on the seven spirits of God. Who would like it? Yeah, man. Your hand was first. <laughs> um, please, please get them. I, I know that... Um, I know that it will help you, and, and so, whatever. And Joe's CDs are, are the same. You know, I've got all the Joe's CDs at home, and they, they're really cool. <laughs> get them. They'll really help you engage, particularly if you want to, to get into the, um, the passion part of the presence of God and engage yourself in the, 
bridal chamber of your heart with the presence of the Lord. It's very, very important. Um, you will find that tomorrow by about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. When I'm talking, you will be doing this. <laughs> How do I know? Because I see it every conference I do. Now, I do know and I can see. So the issue is if your eyes are closing and I don't see the fire in your head, it means you're not praying, which means you give me legal mandate. I don't have him here yet, but I will have him by lunchtime. You give me legal mandate to operate with Sir. Sir is a water gun. Water guns can reach to the end of the church. So if you have your eyes closed, if I have to stay awake on my feet, then I think I have a right to keep you awake so that you can actually listen to me speak. And so our agreement is this, that you come, you, you, you've actually bought a, you don't realize this, but actually you've bought a contract. When you paid and registered to come to the conference, you bought a contract that gave me a legal right to facilitate what is necessary in a meeting. And so I will facilitate that. So I promise you if I see, now I do understand there'll be one or two of you with medical conditions that um, you have sleep apnea and you have these other kind of things that go on. And I do understand all that. But if you get tired, then start praying in the spirit. Because often it's a religious spirit that wants to shut you down to stop you hearing and wants to shut you down from, and stop you from receiving or it's your, your body and your spirit wanting to um, encompass around your spirit man to stop your spirit man becoming who it is supposed to be, which is the one that's in charge. Um, during the, the meetings as well, the worship times, please feel free to get from behind your seat and come stand down the front. You know, if you see one line, go and make two lines. If you see two lines, well, go make three lines. Don't feel that you're bound to sit behind your seat. It's just, I, I, you know, it's a, it's a religious boundary that's been put inside there. And then, then we really used to have seats. I loved it when we were over in Asia, when we were over in, um, where, I don't know what these places were. I can't pronounce these names when you go over there. You know, they have these names and they, oh, 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 and well, whatever. That's all good. And so we were in this place, and they had this church of about 5,500 people, and there were no chairs. And I kind of went, oh, my goodness, where are they going to sit? with all come and sit on the floor so they can all run up the front and move around. And they sit them down in these nice little squares. So there's aisles all the way between them. And the ushers sit them down. And then glory comes in and there's no more squares left. And so it's all good. It's, but, you know, so please don't get caught sitting in your seat. You know, if you need to get down the front for something, then get down the front. Just do whatever you need to do to get yourself out of the boundary of the limitation that you have put around yourself. Hallelujah. Um, okay, so the, so the last thing is, please, um, you'll find that during the sessions, I may need a break. Now, I've got um, probably eight, maybe eight, 12, maybe 12 hours of standing on my feet talking to you over the next two days. Now, if, if I get tired and you come to ask me a question and I say to you, no, actually, I'd like a break, don't feel the deep root of rejection welling up in your life. Um, <laughs> You know, if it does, then I'm happy to pray for you and get you delivered because I love casting out demons in church. I don't mind doing that. Um, so please, if you, if, you, if you see I'm sitting down and you, and you come and say, you know, can I ask you a question? And I say, no, I'd like a break, then just move away. Because there is fivefold repetitive ministry that I'm really good handy at. Uh, <laughs> not really. Sorry, I'm, well, what I'm trying to do is actually just to let you see that there is a funny side to my life. It's not just all, oh, and, and, and to me, spiritually natural is how we should be in the kingdom. I should be able to see and engage the realm of the kingdom and, and actually live out of that arena and actually not have to worry about the natural arena, but actually be fully able to, to participate in this natural arena while I can see stuff. And so it's good to have them here. It's just neat. And so you don't need to kind of worry about what God's going to do. I don't go oh, 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 and get all deeply spiritual. It's natural to be spiritual in who we are. And so I just encourage you to engage this arena. I say to people, there is an atmosphere that we can plug into. Let's plug into it over this time. And then when you go home, hopefully you've got enough endowment and enough revelation that will enable you to walk for the next year in your life to pursue. My desire over this conference time is that I give you the tools to be able to chase God into a deeper level of relationship with Him than what you've already got. Now, you will find that, as, as I say, you'll find everything I do comes out of my own personal relationship. The stuff I will be sharing with you is out of my own personal walk. With word woven into it, so it gives you some sort of mandate. Now, for me, there are things that I will talk about and may talk about that I can't find in the Bible. The same way as I can't find a car in the Bible. 
The same way as they can't find electricity in the Bible, an electricity switch, a light bulb in the Bible, yet they're true because they're here. And there's a lot that is not in the Bible that is true, but there are um, threads of it in the Word. And so there'll be some, it all depends where we go. So, you know, I, I, what I want to do over this conference is lay a foundation for you to build on. And so, and you can build. We have to build. We have to be about building the Father's house and become the cornerstone or the boundary stone of what's needed for the enemy in today's society. So let's, um, we're going to have a, another half an hour or so of worship time, and then um, I'll come and we'll have our first session. It'll be awesome. Father, we yearn after your presence. Father, we yearn to be in your presence and found in before your glory today. Father, thank you we have an entry through what Christ has done for us, that we're able to stand before you and experience the realms of your presence washing over us today. Father, this is our privilege as your sons. This is our privilege, Lord, to be able to walk before you, to be able to walk beside you and experience your kingdom today while we're upon the earth. Father, thank you. Thank you for the governing hand of your presence. Lord, today we acknowledge the cloud of witnesses. We acknowledge the surrounding of the cloud of witnesses. We acknowledge the cherub and the seraph, the angels, the harvesting angels, the hunter angels. We acknowledge their presence today and we welcome their ministry. We welcome the ministering angels of God into our midst. We honor and welcome the anointing and the glory where they come from today. Lord, we honor you. Jesus, you are the author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you really need it, I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this here because we're going to have a lot of time to better engage the presence of God. And I want us to go, you know, we need to get to a place where we can go deeper and deeper and deeper. And I find that as we go through the weekend, there'll be more and more times like this when, I, when my expectation would be that we would go deeper. So next time you start, I want this to be our ground floor. So I want us to start where we started. 15 to 20 minutes ago. This needs to be where we start next time we start to worship. And so keep yourself engaged. Praise the Lord. If you make your way back to your seat, thank you guys. That's awesome. Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, you will find that during the, during the meeting times, when the presence of God comes around, see, for me, I'm used to this level of anointing. I'm used to this level of the presence of God. I've chosen to desire and to live in this atmosphere. And so when it's around, it's normal for me to feel His presence like this and to be in that arena. And so this is what I want us to get to over this weekend, where it becomes normal for you to feel like this, normal for you to feel the atmosphere, the presence of God, not just during worship time, but actually when you're out on the street, when you're out at work, when you on your computer, when you washing dishes when you, I don't know what you do, well, whatever you do. And the issue is to actually for you to engage in the manifestation of his visible and tangible reality here today, every minute of the day. That's my desire, that you would walk in his presence. And so this isn't about, you know, um, having a, but one of the things that I really struggle with in church life, and that is when you come into a meeting and you have people who have not cultivated a relationship with God, and you stand in the front of the meeting, and this happens all over the place, where you stand in front of a meeting and you have a worship time, and there's some spiritual vampire at the church that hasn't walked with the presence of God during the week, sucking your life that you're trying to put in an atmosphere where the glory can come. And they do, they suck it out. They go, <sighs> to make them feel better. Coming to church isn't about making you feel better. It's not about you getting your spiritual buzz for the rest of the week. Coming to church is a place where you're supposed to sow into an atmosphere so you enable everybody else to be lifted to a high level. That's what worship is all about. It's not coming here so you go, wow, and you go home, wow, and then by Monday it's pow because it's all gone. And it's, it, 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 these are the issues that we are facing in church life today. And that some of it is because we lack knowledge and lack understanding on what our role is as a son. And so in the, in the first session, you know, 
for the sake of the tape, I've called it the patterns of the supernatural world. I'm just going to talk bits and pieces in this first session. Take that get that out of my voice, um, please. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk just over some stuff, simple things that I found over this time. <laughs> I know I'm like, not like a snake, and that sounds a bit better. <laughs> Hallelujah. Basically, like a snake is under my feet. Um, you and I, whether you believe it, like it, accept it or not, <coughs> are spirit beings. You're a spirit being. The Bible says this in John, John 4, uh, what is it, John 4, 24. It says, God is a spirit. And those who worship it, Worship him in spirit and in truth. If God is a spirit, then we're made in his likeness from Genesis. It says, Let us make man in our own likeness. And then God made man in his own likeness. Then the fall made us a human being. But unfortunately, many of us end up being human doings. Trying to do things for God to make ourselves better instead of coming to a revelation of who you're supposed to be, which is a spirit. So turn to the person next to you and tell them, I am a spirit. The reason I'm making you say that is because the confession, so out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth, whether you don't believe it or not, actually you've now spoken the word, which means you're now accountable for the future. Isn't that good? Because you'll be held to account for every word that you speak. So if you think it's an idle word, then when you stand before God and God says, remember that day in Central Baptist Church that you said, I am a spirit, and you never did actually understand that, but actually you even chose to engage it. So today, actually, you're going to stay where you are. And everything that's wooden, hay, and stubble is going to get burnt. I don't want that day. I want to be fully engaged today in the fullness of the measure that I can walk in today. And if I am a spirit being, then I have the capacity to be and live in the spirit today. Now, one of the issues that the church is facing is the difference between Greek and Hebrew. And the difference between Greek thinking and Hebrew feeling. The difference between Greek hearing and Hebrew seeing. Two major issues that are confronting the church today. Because there are two kingdoms that exist and are at war in this atmosphere of the canopy that God contained time and space in. Within that atmosphere of that canopy, there are limitations on what the demonic world and the, the kingdom that is in darkness can operate in and do. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. Who made the kingdom that is in darkness? Praise God, we have some revelation in here today. God didn't make the darkness in it, but he made the kingdom. Because that kingdom was originally Adam's. And when Adam sinned, he gave that over to a, a serpent who then had the authority to rule in the kingdom that was destined for Adam to rule in. <sighs> Hallelujah, I can already see I'm going, that's good stuff. And so we come into this issue with the way that the Greek have taught us, where there's one heaven, two heaven, and third heaven, and then whatever else heaven's above that, heaven knows. And the Hebrew thinking, and the Hebrews believe this, that all that is the realm of heaven and the supply that is in the nature of the names of God is as close to me as the air I breathe. All that is in the realm that is in a kingdom that is now in darkness is as close to me as air I breathe. Whichever kingdom I turn into becomes the source of my supply. And so we have taught our intercessors to turn into darkness by telling them to pray against all the demonic things, which has been a good thing. But let me tell you, does God want the demonic thing established or does he want his kingdom established? And surely if you turned into this kingdom, the light that is in this kingdom would just depose that. And so we've had so much about the demonic world, but very little about the angelic realm. How come they don't teach about the classifications of angels? How come they don't teach about the 27 different creatures from the realm of the kingdom of heaven that are mentioned in the Bible? How come they don't talk about these kind of things? How come people don't go ride in chariots, yet they see demon spirits sitting over a city? How come they don't engage the, the horses of God? How come they don't engage the lightnings and whatever else, the wheels, or whatever? 
They're so busy doing this that they'd miss the reality of this, that this would change that if they would only engage it. And so we, we, th there is this issue of the kingdom and what it means. And there are four kingdoms. Well, there's three kingdoms, and then there's a, there's a true kingdom. There's a kingdom of the earth, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and heaven. Heaven is outside of the canopy out of Proverbs 6, 7, and 8, where the word says that I, the spirit of wisdom, was with him when he set his compass and formed the heavens. The word set his compass means he took a round circle out of an atmosphere or out of a place or did whatever he wanted to do to get that round circle. And within that circle, he put all the containment of all the galaxies. Okay, and so now we have the circle, and in that circle, on one of the 450 billion galaxies, in the galaxy called this place called the Milky Way, which is a spiral arm in one galaxy that the Earth is situated in that spiral arm, in this little, little thing called, I don't know, this, this thing called Earth. And on that Earth, in a place called New Zealand, in a city called Hamilton, in a church called uh, Central Baptist Church, you're sitting in one of the galaxies. There's 450 billion of them, some of them have 400 billion stars in them. What I'm trying to do is just to stretch your brain a bit here. Because you get so confined and so locked into the atmosphere you're walking, you don't realize what you're supposed to be, which is the enemy's plan. Because if you knew who you were supposed to be, you'd never be the way you are today. And God wants us to understand that he set a government up within that circle. The government had an, a, a kingdom of the earth in it, which has, I'm not going to go into all this stuff because anyway, whatever, it's under the blood. There's the kingdom of the earth, then there's the kingdom of God, and then there's the kingdom of heaven. And then there's heaven. Heaven is on the outside of that circle. Do you realize that about um, 11 weeks ago, there was a release from the scientific community associated with the... Um, uh, I don't know, some of these fancy telescopes they have that send microwaves out into the farthest known distance of space. And they got to a certain point where they could not go any further because there was an interference between 100 and 150 megahertz. There was like a canopy and an umbrella that would stop anything going further. And so these, these things would bounce back to them over about um, six or seven hours. I don't, whatever. I don't know how all these things work. They just say, this is what happened. The statement was, because of that, the scientific community is wondering that we're living in a hologram. I mean, I could have told them that just from what the Bible says. The containment of time and space is in that little circle with all the galaxies in it. And we're worried about what's going on on the earth instead of realizing that actually there's a galaxy to take care of. And actually, there's 450 million galaxies to take care of. Billions, sorry. Galaxies. Millions wrong. It's not enough. The, you know, there's an amazing... There's the, the, he, I, I have become very fascinated with the Hebrew language. Um, I've got this friend overseas who decided that he would try and learn and read and write Hebrew. He learned it how to read and write it in two weeks. I'm not kind of that good, you know, that kind of stuff. But um, needless to say, I really enjoy it. And this guy can speak fluent Hebrew now. He can sing it. He can sing from the word in Hebrew. He can speak it. He can write it. He can whatever. And he's a bit of a genius. And so, anyway, it frustrates me. But, you know, I've got to do the hard slog. But I really enjoy doing the hard slog because then I get some real good understanding because I lay my nation. Needless to say, the Hebrews have this really interesting, interesting description of the word iniquity. Iniquity is made up of three, three Hebrew symbols or three Hebrew um, letters an ayn, a vav, and a noon. An ayn, which is an eye wide open. Vav, which is um, a hook. And then you have noon, which is an eye. So, sorry, which is multi. <laughs> which is, I'm reading it backwards, so I'm trying to see it forwards. Because Hebrew reads backwards, but you've got to turn around and read it forwards so you can be Greek. And so we have ayn, vav, and noon. And so basically the word iniquity means this. Whatever the eye hooks into multiplies. And so this is where the kingdom comes into play. Because if iniquity is born out of darkness, when something multiplies, it means you might say it's running at 20% in your life, 
But because of the multiplication process, it's actually running at 50% in your life. So when someone is saying, oh, I've got 5% sin, actually sin is running at 45% in your life because it's multiplying because that's the thing you're turning into and that's the thing that's becoming the source of your supply. And so the issue is to turn out of a kingdom that is in darkness. Now, Hebrews don't believe in the atmosphere of the earth that they separated. Sorry, I'll reword that. They don't believe that they're in two different layers. They believe that they're linked like this. And one has the capacity to destroy the other, and you're the one that releases what is needed to destroy the other one. So if you turn into darkness, you destroy the kingdom of light. If you turn into the kingdom of light, you destroy the kingdom of darkness just by turning and making a conscious choice in that. And so in the realm of the kingdom, when I talk about the kingdom, to me, the realm of the kingdom is as close to me as the air that I breathe. All I've got to do is turn into it and engage it, and from that point and perspective, I can see into it and become part of what's going on. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't just want to see into it. I want to go into it and participate with what's going on. After all, that's what spiritual warfare is, you know, take a dragon's head and snap it and stick it and... You know, whatever. I mean, instead it's gun out and take all the gold out and jewels out and diamonds and oil out. I mean, that's our fun. Ah, oh, sweet Jesus. We are so worried about finances. Where do you think they're all stored? If we don't have it, somebody else has got it. And it's been watched very, very closely. I, I love getting in around some of these arenas and, and smashing these things over and getting them to the point where you can split their gut open because all the stuff comes out and then you've got to pick it up and stick it in your mountain and you're going to trade on the sea of glass with it. We don't do any of these things because we've never been told about this stuff. And so actually we just go around going, and nothing ever happens. God wants us to fully participate in the realm of the kingdom. We are his sons. Jesus said, I do nothing but what I see my father do. And I've got to write up my notes. He said, I do nothing but what I see my father do. Well, when Jesus was seeing what his father was doing, do you think he was standing here going, hmm, I'm trying to hear the voice of God? It doesn't say he heard what his father was doing. That's Greek. He said he saw. And so which means that all of us can saw. It's not being, being saw about something. It means actually seeing. Most of us are so busy being whipped by the devil that we saw from being whipped and we... Run away. And we do. I'm serious. The devil goes, raw, And we go, meow, instead of the other way around. The devil's supposed to go, meow, and you go, raw, Bring it on, baby. And a lot of us, because we don't understand who we are and actually the capacity of what is in us. Now, if God is a spirit, and I've been born into a kingdom that houses his spirit, and I am that kingdom on the earth, because you are, you are the kingdom of God on the earth. The kingdom of God is where? Within you. So therefore you are the kingdom of God on the earth. So if I am the kingdom of God, I'm going to bring that kingdom to bear into the face of the earth. And it comes through my life. What I need to do is engage the kingdom that is within me and join it with the kingdom of heaven, which is on the outside of me. And then you've got two poles of the magnetic field. You've got an arc can form between them. Light. When the light is there, things happen. And so the, the, the necessity for us to engage the kingdom that is within us is very, very important. The names of God that are very important for us. I've been on this journey, I don't know, for about the last year and a half now, eh? Carl, the guys in my group, one of the core people in the group, and Mike is sitting over there. There's another one of the guys that I've been working with. If you want to ask some questions and I can't give them to you, go see them. They'll probably give you some good answers. Um, what was I talking about? Names. And so one of the key things, you just write that from the CD, praise God, no. Um, one of the key things is the names of God. If you don't get to grips with a supply of the revelation knowledge that is in the names of God that are available to you out of the realm of the kingdom of heaven, then you will not get to grips with the reality of who you are in that kingdom. Because don't you carry in you the DNA of the person who gave his name. 
You, you carry that. When you get born again, your spirit man has that capacity of that DNA implanted back within it where your spirit begins to come alive again. The only way your spirit can come alive is if there is a different DNA that is put inside there than the one you were born with. In the last session, I'm going to talk about the DNA of God and about communion, and we're going to take communion in a different way. And so what I, what I found is that if I have this DNA inside of me, then, then that thing has a sound in it. Your DNA, this thing's going in and out. Is that me? No. It's what? Because it's in my pocket. Where do you want it? I'll tell you what, let's take that off because I'm starting to get hot. Yeah, I do fry batteries. That's what I'm just aware of. <laughs> um, I'm serious. I'll be, I'll be at a conference where we went through about, I don't know how many batteries... The wedding, I do. <laughs> these microphones, I can't hold them because they fry like battery dead. Anyway, it's all good. Praise God. Um, what was the names of God? And so the importance of that DNA, if we carry that DNA inside of us, then the reality of that DNA exists in the realm of the kingdom that is called the kingdom of heaven. And what it needs is an agreement between this kingdom and that kingdom, because what happens, science, you know, I, I lo- I'm, I'm getting into science, and I, lo- I really love it. I mean, I was a, I got bi- English biology and physics and blah, blah, and, I, and you have people like Joe and all these other guys that are getting into science, and I've been just going, going oh, feed me, because the things I'm in the spirit. And one of the things they've discovered is you can take a particle, have it here, put a particle on the other side of the galaxy, and have them resonating at the same resonance, and information without any known contact will flow from that to that and be instantaneously there in both of them. Science is just proving the kingdom. And so what, they, what, what I'm saying is inside of us, there is a DNA that carries a resonance. You've just got to get yourself connected with that resonance and get it in line with the resonance that exists there, then all that information that is there can be instantaneously put in here. Now that really changes the way you pray. Because I don't have to say, Oh God, I ask that today you will turn up in a meeting and that your presence would be so wonderfully there that, um, and I hope you turn up. If you're praying like that, actually, who's moved? He hasn't. He's omnipresent. So you're the ones that have moved. Which means that actually in a meeting like this, he is able to be all that he is in an atmosphere because he's omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. That means he can be all in everything and around everything and have all power in any meeting he likes. All we've got to do is this, get this in tune with that, and this will manifest through us into this. So instead of praying, oh my God, that you would come, Father, that you would enable me to engage. Teach me how to engage your kingdom. Show me what I need you to do in here to get this in tune with that. So that the sound makes the same. Your, do you know your DNA carries the sound? Scientists have proven that your DNA sings a song and you're the only one that has that song. Science is proving the gospel. It vibrates. DNA vibrates. And it goes, uh, and it sings a song. They can, they can trace it and track it on these fancy scopes that they have. Each individual human being has a different song that their DNA sings, and no two songs are ever the same. So that means if this fallen state of DNA can sing, what happens with a resurrected state? And what is it singing? My issue is to get this in line with this, because when this begins to engage, that comes here. And so don't all walk around the street going, I mean, I've had people do that. That's okay. I mean, whatever. Whatever gives you an anchor for the reality, the potential possibility of the truth of God, then do it. 
I mean, I've done some weird things, and we'll be talking about that a bit later on, about some of the things that I've done to engage the supernatural world so that the reality of what God's Word says is true will come to pass in my life. And so there's some key things here that I think would be important for us. Number one is, I'm going to give you some Greek stuff now. You've had enough kind of Hebrew, you'll now have a bit of Greek. When I go Greek, I go structure. When I go Hebrew, I'm all over the place, which is really good because then it gives you more questions here and I try and give you some answers here and then I'll go Greek again because, you know, I, 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 I love preaching. I mean, I'm, I just absolutely love it. I love te- not preaching, but teaching. Because what I, what I love watching is I love watching Revelation hit on people's lives because it goes like, it's like fireflies that comes around their head and kind of goes in and out of their body and moves around and goes, and, it goes, and, you, and you see people do this. It's like, oh, there's another one. Get them out oh. So I mean, that's why I love it, because I can see, and it's wonderful to watch it happen. Just the glory. See what happens, because it's a tone. You see, it's the sound of what you produce in your life. Whatever your sound is, gets, attracts things. Okay, it attracts things. Joe teaches, does a fantastic teaching on, on, on this guy that was singing the song all the time, and, and, and there was a sound of color in a song that was released by, the, by the, what the environment and by the choices they were making. And, and if you make bad ones, then you attract demonic spirits to it, and they feed on it and feed into it. And so when you release this, and that's why I love bringing revelation and teaching this kind of stuff, because it releases the kingdom, and it makes your whole body go, and gets in tune, get in tune, man, become a you know, tuning fork. Hallelujah. Um, number one is you've got a purpose to engage. When you need to and want to engage the kingdom realms of God, You've got a purpose to do it. You don't sit there and ask it for, for it to happen. You purpose to chase it. Pursue after the presence of God. Don't sit here waiting for Him to come down to you. God wants you to chase Him. He wants you to pursue Him. You, you need to give yourself a purpose for your engagement. Don't just go, oh, I'm chasing God. Because you'll go, why? What, what do you want to understand from me? See, when my children come to me, you know, other than wanting money, when they go, dad, 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 you know, you get so sick and tired if you give them money you know, sometimes. But when they're younger, it's like, don't tell your mom. <laughs> See, we've got to be like that with God. We've got a purpose to chase him and, and get in his face. Get right in the face of the Lord and say, Well, Father, this is what I would like to know. And every time he moves, you stand in front of him. <laughs> I want to see what you're doing. Because <laughs> eventually what will happen, and, and the scripture is full of these kind of examples. I hope my breath wasn't smelling. <laughs> That's all good. I think... <laughs> What, what, what oftentimes happens is that God will see your purpose because he sees everything anyway. And when you begin to come into tune or harmony with his purpose for your life, he will give you the mandate. And so you purpose yourself to engage him. You've got to purpose yourself to pursue and chase after the person of God. Get in his face. He is a person, you know. He's not some ethereal, mystical, clouded form that kind of goes like that. You know, he's not that space thing goes, you know, whatever. Whatever you think he is, he's not that. He's a person. He is God and King and omniscient and omnipresent, but fully able to be aware of everything you're doing, even your choices, because you take him through them because he's in you anyway. See, even when you're doing the bad things, you're still in you and going through them with you. You're taking them through your sacrifice to that thing you're doing. Got a purpose. Daniel 1.8. I'm being really naughty, aren't I? Hallelujah, Father. This is a good God. got a sense of humor. He made me. <laughs> Daniel 1.8. This is Daniel purposed in himself. When you purpose in yourself, you've got to engage your mind. It's like people come into worship and they go, You're talking about my bow tie, we each tie each other's bow ties. I'm all happy with my bow ties tied. Actually, it doesn't mean a thing. You can spend a lot of time praying in tongues 
and it might do you some good, but unless your heart and spirit is engaged in what you're saying, then it actually becomes a sounding gong that makes a lot of noise. If, if Jasher went to me, actually wouldn't have a conversation with him because there's no purpose in what I'm doing. And so when you pray, you've got to engage your mind with thought-provoking patterns and things from the Word that enable your spirit to produce the fruit of what's desired in the heart of God. And you've got to purpose yourself to do that. The next one is desire. It says, what's everything you desire? When you pray, ask, and you receive. It doesn't say, what's everything you speak? It doesn't say, what's everything you hear? Or what's everything you speak? But out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And whatever you desire is in your heart. Whatever you speak opens the door for the pattern of your life to be walked through. They have discovered in science, not so long ago, that the heart, they've made this statement, I think it's cool, I think you can go and check it up on YouTube or on whatever it is, Google or whatever you do those things. Get these kids and they go, Rrr, oh, look at that, wow. You know, and I mean, I go, trying to figure out what they do. You know, you've got to forgive me because I'm quite not there yet. Until about two and a half or three years ago, I never even knew how to use a computer. Just didn't need it because I've got another computer going on. It's just wonderful. Hallelujah. But anyway, and so you can, get on the, you can get on the places where you can engage these things. And so um, they, they had this, this thing that came through. They've been doing a test for a year on the number of people cutting in and out. And, and I know that's not me. I don't know what's going on. On the other side. Praise God. Is that better? We'll see. Heart, thank you. And so what, 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 they, what, they, what they have come up with and they've stated on this, this um, scientific document is they have categorically proved that the heart is a greater thinking organism than what the mind is. I could have told them that a long time ago. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. See? And, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> Mind shift. And the reason is this. Where does all your heart, all the, all the body sustenance, energy, and power come from get pumped around your body? From the heart. So what happens in here is if your heart sets the pattern for your life, then your blood carries that pattern. Therefore, the first place the blood goes, when it is fully oxygenated, with the most capacity, it goes directly into your brain. And so whatever's programmed into your blood by your heart goes into your brain, and you begin to think what your heart is telling you. And so we have this problem now because we don't want to say some of these words because the occult world has taken them, filled them with demonic stuff, fed them back to the church, and so you can't use them. So I'm going to use some of them. One of them is energy. You can call it glory. You can put other names on it that you want to put on it. But actually, what it is is electromagnetic energy that can read by the static power of this graph thing that they have, the, the energy that extends out of your heart where there's electromagnetic activity within that field of your heart extends out about eight or nine feet around your body. The human mind extends six or seven inches outside of your body. So here's my issue. If my heart is purposed and desiring to engage the realm of the kingdom of heaven, that becomes a predominant thing that begins to surround my life. Not only does it become the predominant thing, but I'm, it begins to captivate my mind because my heart is programming my blood to think these things. And therefore, what is in my heart will begin to fill my mind. And as my mind begins to get expanded with the desire of my heart, then God can give me the desires 
of my heart. The Bible doesn't say God gives me the desires of my mind. It gives me the desires of my heart. I'll be talking about this a bit later, but there's maybe. There's four chambers of your heart. The four chambers are very important for you. I'm just going to give them to you. And each of them is a teaching session, and I haven't done them yet, but whatever. You can just take them away and do whatever you want. I don't care. If you make it paper, don't have it, throw it away. But you'll be responsible for what I say to you today. The four chambers of your heart that you need to develop in your life. One is the garden of your own heart. There's many scriptures that are plowing the ground and doing all the stuff with the garden of your own heart. Another one is the, another chamber of the heart is the bridal chamber where you become intimately entwined with the presence of God. Another one is the dance floor, where you get so lost in passion and desire for Him. And the last one is the soaking room of the preparation of the bride, where you can get soaked and embalmed with the manifested power of His glory within your life. And that begins to change your whole blood. Each of these things affects your life. Genesis 1, it says that a river that ran through Eden, then into the garden that God put eastward in Eden, two different places, and I'll be talking about that later. And it says, from thence it parted into four heads, and they watered the earth out of the abundance, out of their belly, and out of our life is going to flow rivers of living water that are going to water the earth. Every one of them is about intimacy and friendship and relationship. This is the kingdom that God has given us that we are able to walk in today. The third one, is you've got to set yourself. You set yourself by aligning to your purpose and your desire. You've got to set yourself in those things. It says that David set himself to seek the Lord. You've got to set your spirit man. Take all the distractions. Get them out of the way. Set yourself to engage and stay there until the object of your desire is manifested. Set your desire. Set yourself. Each of these things is woven like a fabric into one another. You've got to set yourself to do these things. The next one is you must engage. You don't... Now, I'm going I'm to just pull this one out a bit and talk about it because we've got a, another 10 minutes or so before I have to finish the session. Engaging is very, very important. You do not engage from the outside in. You engage from the inside out. We are so busy in church trying to pull an atmosphere to make me feel better from there down into here. Actually, if anything that comes from the outside in, it's not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it unravels completion. Anything that comes from within is just from the tree of life, which brings to completion. And God wants us to walk in completion. And so whatever flows out of our life must come from within us, which changes the atmosphere and who we are. When you engage, if I say to my, if I say to them, actually, there's a specific place I'm standing that actually locks out. I mean, walking around to try and find out where it is. And it's about right, it's about right here somewhere. Anyway, so I've, I've kind of, I, I've, I've recognized where it is, so I'll just um, stay away from it. Um, and so one of the things that I, I've done is, <laughs> my family knows what's going on, so it's all good. They know me too well. <laughs> um, engaging. And so one of the things I've learned to do is that we, we, you can't just stay here and expect everything to happen for you. If I was to say to my wife, Hi. I'm coming around to your house today. Or I'm, oh, sorry, if I wasn't in, sorry, let's start again. She's my wife, so I'll be in the house anyway. So let's take a different example. Before I was married to my wife, I, I would ring up and say, hi, I'm coming around to your house today. She said, great, what time are you going to be? Oh, 10 minutes time. And an hour and a half later, she's waiting there. And then we say, hi, honey, I'm coming around to your house again today. An hour and a half, she's waiting there. I don't think I'd develop a relationship with her very well. I, I, I really don't think that would happen. Yet this is how we behave with God. We say, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm coming and we stay here. In His mercy, in His loving kindness, in His grace, in His compassion, He has maintained the visiting hours. And occasionally, 
When he's sick of waiting, he comes down and visits us. But his desire is that you would go to where he is. That's why the Bible says things like, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Come unto me, all you who are here, weary, and here, hairy and heavy laden. <laughs> weary and heavy laden. Remove that from the CD. That's all good stuff. Praise God. For those, by the way, for those folks who don't know, I am actually not a pastor. I'm not in full-time ministry, thank God. I don't have a church. I still have a ministry, but I really don't, don't really, you know, whatever. I'm a businessman. I employ 32 staff, and I have a full-time job running my business, one of them. I have another business, and then there's another business overseas that I'm involved in. So I'm a businessman. I'm not a teacher or a pastor. Pastor, pastor. Man, like, I'm going to get my brain in. You've got to excuse me. There's things happening in the spirit world that I'm getting so buzzed by. I'm so enjoying myself. I'm getting half drunk, and I can't speak properly. It's all your fault. She did it. <laughs> God's desire is that we would go to where he is to see what he's doing because unless you can see what he's doing, you'll never understand how to do it. You can't hear it. You've got to see it. And so this is my desire for the church. The church will come to a point where it can enter into the full capacity of being able to engage and see. Now, all of us will see differently. You'll see in the measure that you're engaged with and who you are and your nature and your personality. Some people are more knowers than seers, but they see because they know. And some people are more, more seers than they know because they see. And so you can all get confused, but that's all good. No, I won't. Get the CD. <laughs> I, I can remember speaking one day, and I had this revelation. And I was, I, like I was, often when I'm teaching, I don't see this little paper you know, that has a few notes on it. I see other things, and so I was preaching of the scroll, and I was busy there teaching them the scroll, and I was going, that's good stuff. I need to get the CD and write that. That's good notes. And this lady said, oh, Ian, could you repeat that for me? And I went, no. <laughs> get the CD. You, you've got to sit and engage. You must purpose inside yourself. Another one is faith. You've got to do it by faith. Now, faith isn't necessarily blind. Okay? If I set my desire on that, I have faith because I know that in it is water. So if I set my desire on it, I can go and pick it up and drink it. Okay? Faith engages a reality. It doesn't engage a non-reality. So faith is very important, particularly with regards to the kingdom that we need, to, it, we need to hold on to and become part of. I'll just go stand over here. And so we need to engage the reality of what the Word says, and I'm going to teach on how to use the Word as a doorway. But it requires faith to believe that what the Word says is true, that I can go into the Word and see it and experience it. Because all the Bible is is somebody else's record of their experience with God. That's why I said, was it last night when I was dreaming? Oh my goodness. No, maybe it wasn't. This, no, it was here. This, this is not God. Yet many of us have treated it like God. Now, I had to fast off this so I could get this functioning properly. Because the revelation that needed to sit in here would be stopped by me continually reading this because I wouldn't spend the time meditating. And I don't mean sitting with my legs crossed going, minum, minum, minum. been there, done that, plain stupidity. I mean, engaging the reality of the potential possibility of what is written there and allowing myself to mull on it and to contemplate it and to meditate around it and to look into it and to experience it and experience emotions and what it was to feel the Word. I don't get that out of reading it. It's very important that when, when you do what you need to do, that you engage reality with faith. The Word is reality. The reality that we read is somebody else's experience with the, <laughs> with the presence of God. And it's really, really good for us to do that. 
We need to engage reality with faith. Otherwise, it becomes a sounding gong. And you go, oh, yeah, I'm faith this. And when you don't faith it enough, we, we, we blame it, we frame it, and do all those kind of things to it. And say, oh, it just doesn't work. But actually, it does work. The issue is you're not engaging the reality of what God's wanting you to see. See, not hear. The reality is what you see, not what you hear. We've taught the church how to hear the voice of God. If only we taught them enough how to see, the church would be in a different place. The last one really is to prepare for enlargement. Extend the borders of your tent. I found out the reason they did that was because usually it was so smelly in there that they'd spread them out so that the wind could blow underneath in the flaps. And what would happen is the skin would eventually stretch to that boundary and then they'd extend them again. Extend them again. That's how they made their tents get bigger, by allowing the wind to blow and by living in it. The only way you can begin to extend the borders of your tent as if you live in the reality of the kingdom. If you don't live in it, and you think it's something there, then you will never extend the borders of your tent. You've got to live in the tabernacling tent of the presence of God so it can grow over you. And then as it grows, then you can stretch it out and stretch it out and stretch it out and stretch it out until it can encompass the whole world. The Bible talks about that, that King Nebuchadnezzar, was it? I think it was in, in the Word. It talks about how he became a tree and he filled the whole earth. Well, God's desire is that we become a tree of righteousness and we become a tree of life to the world. And that others will come and eat from that tree that is within us, of the life of the ground of the kingdom of heaven, that others, others can participate and take part in that. One of the key things I found when I, there's a whole lot of things I can talk about, but I'm not going to just for the sake of time now is not to desire your engagement with the spirit world, but rather desire the engagement with the kingdom world of God. If you desire, I can remember praying, Father, I want to see in the spirit. Lord, I want to see. I want to, you know, because when I was involved in other stuff, I used to see. And then, then God graciously removed that garbage from my life so I could undo that junk and get delivered and then actually begin to see in the right way, in the right place. And I'm saying, Father, I want to see in the spirit. And, and he said, but what do you think you're doing? And I went, well, Lord, you know, I don't know if God speaks to you about it. But sometimes he does with me, particularly when I'm immature and trying to grow, because I'm like a child. It's good when you get a little bit more mature because you can argue back and say, because cause I'm doing this. You know, you're going to have lots of relationships all about two-way communication. And so he said, what do you think you're doing? And I said, well, I want to see. He says, well, why are you asking me to see in the Spirit? Didn't you do that before? And I went, uh, yes. He says, well, what do you want to see in the Spirit or do you want to see my kingdom? He said, well, I want to see your kingdom. He said, well, why don't you ask me for the right thing? Then you might find you'd get it. And it was just like, oh, slap. And so I went from, Lord, I want to see in the Spirit to the Father, I want to see in your kingdom. I want to see in the realm of the glory, the realm of the angelic, the realm that you move in. Father, I want to see you. I want to behold your majesty. And, 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 and so I set my heart. And I planted the seeds, and I did what was necessary to cultivate that, and then it became a reality for me. And you've got to sit, you see. And so what I ask, what I say to people today is ask right. Don't just ask because somebody else is asking. You know, oh, Lord, I want to have faith. Well, yeah, I know you're asking that, but actually, what do you want to have faith for? Oh, Lord, I desire this. Well, why do you desire it? Is it to fulfill your need or to come closer to me? Because if it's to fulfill your need to make yourself feel closer to me, then actually you're asking wrongly, your desire should be for me. Do you remember, remember in the Spirit one day, I was busy praying, trying to get to grips with some stuff in my life, and, and out of the blue, Lord said to me, why do you love me? Oh, well, Lord, I love you because of this. And he says, really? Why do you love me? Oh, well, Lord, you know, well, why do you love me? But, 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 you know, you become a chicken. You show your butt so you can kick it, you know, whatever. It was all good. See, it's relationship. God wants relationship. The Father wants relationship. The Father wants intimacy and friendship. He wants you to see what he does so you can do the same thing that he does. He wants you to see his kingdom so you can engage it and become part and one with that kingdom so you can reveal it here today on the face of the earth, not when you die. I don't want all the stuff. I don't want to be walking through walls when I die. I mean, what a waste of time. I want to be doing that today. I mean, translocation is another thing. Praise God has been going on for, I don't know, eight, ten years now. Hallelujah. It's wonderful stuff. This is the kind of thing we're supposed to be doing. 
today. Living in the reality of His kingdom today. Not living in some religious, demonic-inspired system of information and control that there's no liberty in your spirit. Understand religious demons. Hate them. Because what they do is they try and stop you going into the kingdom. And they'll say to you, Oh, that's demonic. You can't do that. Really? Well, I've been doing it for 24 years. You're a bit late. And Jesus calls them Pharisees or Sadducees because they're really Sadducees. So, you know, whatever. They're Pharisees because they couldn't see. And so the Bible, Jesus addresses them. He says, you who know the truth, you stand in the door those that would go in, you deny them, and you won't even go in yourself. That's a religious demon. And I know religious demons, the moment they say, you can't do that, you're really too late. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. We're going we're to finish off there because it's now 12 o'clock. Um, what I'm trying to do is lay a foundation for where we're going. Because our foundation is about the kingdom. It's his kingdom present here in reality today and our capacity to engage there to become who we are in that kingdom and then to walk in the kingdom and not only see it as revelation or as, as, as visions or visit, but to have a visitation where I participate in those things of heaven. I want to be there all the time experiencing it able to see, able to engage, able to do the things, able to engage the angelic realm, able to engage the supernatural world and see and, and communicate and talk. And, you know, all those good things you're supposed to do. Got a bit of high there, right? Eh? Hallelujah. <laughs> and so, let's just pray. Father, Father, I want to thank you today for the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord, for heaven. Lord, our final resting place, the place we come from, is heaven. Father, we want to go back there. We want to be one with you and to understand who we are in you and become one with you again as we were before the beginning. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would bless these people. Father, with the knowledge of the realm of the kingdom of heaven over this weekend, that you would bless them with the revelation knowledge of who they are in God and who they are in Christ and the manifested power of that dominion of the kingdom. Lord, you would bless them with that power in the name of Jesus. Father, you would open the eye of their understanding that it would be enlightened to know the height and depth and breadth of their calling and the anointing of the Son. Father, I bless them with that. Lord, we go to eat. I bless their fellowship together in the name of Jesus Christ. As you are. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We come back at 1.30 today. Amen.